All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, coming to my talk, and thank you very much, organizers, for inviting me here. It's much appreciated. You know, a great, uh, great setting, and a very interesting talk so far. Uh, so I'm going to talk about percolation on the <coughs> hyperbolic plane, and also, so I should say, so at any time, feel free to interrupt me, heckle me, ask questions, or uh, if you don't like my talk, I don't mind if you uh, walk out. I'm very used to that, <laughs> as teaching undergraduates. Um, all right, so yeah, and also, so pl please don't be offended. So my, I usually give the talk to people, well, for a general audience, and uh, I wasn't really sure what people uh, know or don't know, but uh, having seen um, some of the talks, I guess you all know, uh, are quite knowledgeable, and I'm. You know, so please don't be offended if I say stuff that is uh, that you already know, All right? So what's a, uh, so we're going to start by defining uh, Poisson Voronoi percolation in the Euclidean case. So I take a Poisson process, which um, well you probably already know, but one way to characterize that is to say that I have a random subset of the plane with the property that if I take any set, then the number of points that fall inside it is a random variable with mean lambda times the area of the set and it follows a Poisson distribution. And moreover, if I take a bunch of disjoint sets, then the points that fall inside it are uh, disjoint. The counts of points that fall inside it are disjoint. Um, right? So the Voronoi cell of a particular point, uh, one of these random points from the set Z, is just everything in the, in the plane that is closer to it than to any other of the Poisson points. So that's a Voronoi cell. So that defines a kind of uh, partition of the plane. Um, and then uh, for percolation, so we're going to flip coins to decide what cells are going to be black and what cells are going to be white. Uh, except in all my pictures, uh, the black is going to be light blue because that uh, seemed to look better, right? So here's a, a picture of what that look like, uh, might look like in the Euclidean case. Um, Right, and so percolation, uh, if you look it up in a dictionary, it says something like this. So it's a passage of um, a fluid um, through a porous medium. So we all enjoy the benefits of percolation uh, several times a day, I guess, when we drink coffee. Um, right, and so here, uh, but for our purposes, so I'm not going to give uh, an overview of uh, uh, percolation theory, it's a, a very important uh, subject in uh, modern probability theory. But yeah, for us, so percolation will be, um, well, the event that there's an infinite connected cluster of black cells, right? So, or uh, put differently, let me go back, right? So, uh, if, if I put a snail somewhere in a black cell, or is it possible for a snail to travel infinitely far, staying only on the, on the light blue part? Right, and so there's something called the critical probability, which is, um, in some sense, the smallest p for which uh, percolation is possible. Right, so there are two, in principle, there are two parameters, right? There's lambda, which tells me how many points per unit area I'm going to drop down into the plane, right? The parameter of the Poisson process, and there's p. But by standard properties of the Poisson process, you can uh, see that actually does not this PC does not depend on lambda. Right? The reason is that if I take a Poisson process and I make a dilation, so for every point I multiply both coordinates by the same number, then I get a new Poisson process with a different intensity, and the, you, uh, but the shape of all the Voronoi cells don't change. Right? The size has changed, but like it's uh, so. Um, does it make sense? Yeah. I guess for, yeah. For some of you are anyway. At least I, I didn't defend you to the part where it's visible for me. All right, so um, the PC has been uh, studied for the Euclidean case. So first result was by um, Artem Swavich, who did, was it um, Weizmann, I think, at the time. So he showed that um, PC is at least one half. So in particular, he showed that if P is one half or less, then the probability of percolation is zero. And then it took about 10 years later, uh, until about 10 years until uh, Bolbash and Jordan showed that actually for every p bigger than one half, the probability, 
that there's an infinite cluster is actually positive. It's in fact one. And uh, yeah, that was uh, technically quite, uh, quite, a, quite a difficult uh, <coughs> technical argument. Uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, there are, some for, there are some fairly standard arguments that tell you that, so once there is um, a, um, an infinite cluster, there will be only one. So any two points that are in an infinite cluster, they also have a, a path connecting them. So there, there's only one. Yeah, and in fact, so in some sense, this is only the start. So there's been a lot of more work on uh, Voronoi percolation in particular, a lot of attention at what happens exactly at uh, p is equal to uh, one half. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to discuss that because that's not the direction I'm going to be taking. Right, so uh, we're going to go for the hyperbolic plane. So uh, again, so I guess, again, so please don't be offended. I guess Dieter already did a really great job of, uh, and uh, like I've seen a lot of the pictures that I have here already several times, so I'm not going to, uh, maybe I just, go qu very quickly over it, right? So here's a hyperbolic plane is a surface where every point is a particular kind of saddle point and here's a picture of what that might look like. So for most people, of course, uh, outside of this room, when they first hear the definition, it might be kind of hard to picture what it looked like. So this is a picture that I actually, I shamelessly screen grabbed it without permission and included in my uh, presentation. But this is from an article from the 90s and then I emailed the author, so how did you make this picture? Because I would like to do visualizations of my percolation or thing. And he said, well, I actually drew it by hand and then the journal made, uh, asked this um, airbrush artist to make it look nice. So uh, in the 90s, journals actually did something to make your papers nicer. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, but then he also said, but don't you know it can't be done, right? So he referred to this um, result by Hilbert that there's no kind of faithful representation as a two-dimensional surface of the hyperbolic plane, but in fact there's a, um, a Dutch, this was the, f so the first uh, president of IHES in France was actually a Dutch mathematician called Kuiper, so uh, in fact it is kind of possible, but that paper doesn't um, give, you know, doesn't give anything that I can turn into some nice maple code that uh, can give me um, a visualization. Um, and I've actually tried to enlist the help of uh, several differential geometers with this, but they, they all told me to get lost. Um, anyway, so um, we're gonna, By the way, yeah? This has been done recently. What? So the, uh, the C1 embedding is the hyperbolic I think that was like 1955, the paper so I mentioned. Like this year, last year, so one of my postdocs with the embedding. Yeah. Like with the, but with actual code that I can draw something on or? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. All right, nice, yeah. Oh, okay, cool, thanks, so I'll have a look. Thanks, yeah. Well, anyway, but yeah, so I, I don't need it, right? So I'm gonna be using the uh, Poincaré disk model. So here's another picture by, this is circle limit three, I believe, by the uh, Dutch artist Escher. Um, right, so the idea is that all these fishes are actually um, the same shape in the hyperbolic plane. Right, so, so it's a anyway, and uh, right, so there's a so the hyper the Poincaré disk is just a disk with a particular metric and an area functional. Right, so the area of a subset of the disk is now given by you integrate this over the area. And yeah, we, well, this we've seen before, right? So geodesics, a ball in the Poincaré disk just looks like a Euclidean ball, except that the center and the radius are different, so the, the center is not the apparent center. Um, right, we have these formulas for area of a ball and circumference, and so they're both uh, exponential on the radius, and also interestingly, they uh, roughly have the same asymptotics, right, so take the ratio and go to infinity to actually one. And yeah, so. The isometries behave nicely, so they're described by a certain kind of uh, um, what's called Möbius transformations. Anyway, I'm not going to use that. Um, right, so what are we going to do? We're going to make uh, Poisson Bourdieu percolation on the hyperbolic plane. So it's actually defined in exactly the same way. So we take a Poisson point process, but on the hyperbolic plane, 
which means that um, for every subset of the hyperbolic plane, the number of points that falls inside it is a random variable whose mean is lambda times the hyperbolic area, and it has a Poisson distribution, and independent. So if I take disjoint sets, then the point counts are independent, right? And uh, in fact, you can also view it as uh, a Poisson point process with non-constant intensity on the plane if I just take this area uh, functional um, you know, uh, for my intensity of the plane. Uh, right, so I can just make an um, intensity function on the, on the unit disk and then I get the same thing, basically. And of course now the Voronoi cell is everything that is closer in the hyperbolic metric, and uh, the closer to Z than to any other Poisson point. Um, and again, we're going to flip coins to decide whether, um, what the color is of each cell. Yeah, so. uh, and so, yeah, so here's a picture of what it looks like in the prong disk representation. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, so indeed, so I guess um, even though these cells, they look very different, they somehow, if I did a proper um, isometry, then they should look, they kind of should look the same, right? So it's like they, they look very different in the picture, but they actually have kind of same behavior. Right, so again, we, uh, we want to be we're interested in uh, percolation occurring. So is there an infinite path of uh, blue cells, right? So can you travel infinitely far staying only on the blue? And uh, again, we have the critical probability, but now I put the parameter lambda because the argument saying that it doesn't depend on lambda, it doesn't uh, make sense anymore, right? So there's no, you cannot really even talk about dilations directly, so it's not clear whether or not it will depend on lambda. Maybe it will. Um, yeah, so that's what I wrote here. And in fact, well, so in fact, so there, this model was um, first studied by Ita Benjamini and Aldet Schramm in uh, around 2000. And in fact, so they showed that, uh, well, this PC of lambda is strictly between zero and one half for every lambda. Um, and then they also, so it does in fact depend on lambda, right? Because if you take the lambda, lambda parameter going to zero, then PC goes to zero. So it gets easier and easier to percolate as you drop fewer and fewer points onto the, onto the, onto the hyperbolic plane. Um, and also what is maybe more spectacular, so it's fundamentally different from the Euclidean case, right? So if I'm below this critical value, obviously there are no infinite clusters, right? And it's also true if I'm exactly on the critical value. And uh, yeah, there's a kind of symmetry, like, if, so if I go uh, P is bigger than one minus PC, then I, in fact there will be one unique infinite cluster. So kind of like in the in Euclidean case, but of course now there's a gap, right? Since PC is strictly less than one half, there's a, there's a gap between these two things. And there, uh, there will actually be infinitely many infinite clusters that are not connected. So there will be lots of black things separated by infinite white things. So that, yeah, that's very different from, from most reasonable percolation models in Euclidean space. And so their paper also had the, the following uh, diagram. Again, I screen grabbed it uh, without permission. Uh, Okay, so this is, not, this is not an actual plot of PC, right? This is just something that they drew uh, probably with Xfig or something, right? So this is a diagram of what they, partly their result and part, partly some conjectures, right? So this, this in blue is mine, right? So this is supposed to be PC, right? It's always been zero and one half. It has, has limit zero. If you're below PC of lambda, there are no infinite clusters. Above one minus PC, there's gonna be one. And here there's a region where there's uh, infinitely many infinite clusters. And as this picture suggests, they uh, believe that if lambda goes to infinity, PC of lambda has to attend to one half, right? And that's also something that they wrote explicitly as a conjecture in their paper. Um, and so together with um, my PhD student, uh, Benjamin Hansen, we um, actually proved that. So, uh, oh yeah, I should say so. All of this is joint work with Benjamin Hansen, who uh, finished his PhD a while ago, and now he already makes a lot more than me 
as a quant working in the Seattle area. Um, yeah, and another thing that, uh, that Benjamin and Sharm asked in that paper, uh, so what can you say about the behavior of this PC of lambda, right? So what kind of function of lambda is it? And in particular, um, one of the things they asked, what about the asymptotics as lambda goes to zero? And they had, so they had some upper bound that um, had certain asymptotics, uh, but we were, so we were able to show that it behaves like pi over three times lambda plus um, small order term <coughs> in terms of lambda, which is actually uh, a bit below the lower bound, the, the upper bound that uh, Benjamin and Sharm had in their paper. All right. Um, yeah, any questions so far? Oh. Everybody's still happy? Um, right, so some, some uh, let me just say some uh, words about, about the first of the results of lambda goes to infinity. So as you can expect, right, so yeah, so I didn't say that, but so the paper of Benjamin and Schramm was in 2000, and in 2006, Bolobas and Jordan show that indeed PCs one half, so they, they were not, um, that paper didn't exist yet. Um, so what we, what we can do is we can actually leverage a lot of the work that Bolobas and Jordan did uh, for the Euclidean case. And so the, the intuition behind it is maybe rather obvious. So I have this two dimensional manifold, right? If I, the number of points per unit area that you drop into it increases, points are typically closer and closer together. And locally, the geometry will look more and more like the Euclidean plane. So that the Voronoi cells are getting smaller and smaller, but they're also going to behave more and more like Euclidean Voronoi cells. So locally, the picture should be the same, right? Um, but of course, that's not, uh, that doesn't directly give a proof because we are interested in a, in a global characteristic, right? And just because it locally behaves more and more. So there is some work to be done, but um, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna, gonna say more about it. So you can actually see, so Ben did a, um, so soon after we put this paper on archive, we were actually invited to speak in the Percolation Today seminar and Ben gave a talk there and uh, it's still online. So you can, uh, he got like two hours or something. So you can see all the details in the talk or read the paper, which has already appeared. Um, yeah, but anyway, that's the main intuition behind it. So I'm going to focus more on the lambda to zero result, which is, well, it's more technical. So this paper is not yet appeared, it's on the archive. It's about 70 pages, uh, rather technical, but I'll just uh, try and describe the intuition behind it, right? So what we, what we want to show is that, uh, uh, right, if P is one plus epsilon times pi for three times lambda, then there will be, um, if lambda goes to zero, then there will be a, a giant, uh, an infinite component with probability one. And if P is, let's say, one minus epsilon times this function, there won't be an infinite <coughs> component, right? And the um, idea is so, well, for the, the first step, the upper bound on PC is, well, we'll show that if I take, if I add the origin to the Poisson point process, um, that's actually not going to change whether or not there's an infant cluster. So I, I add the origin, I color it so black, and uh, whether or not it is there is not really going to change uh, whether there's an infant cluster. And um, yeah, so what you show is that what will show is that the cluster. If I if I build the cluster of that um, of the point of the origin, it looks like. So we're in France, so I should have said bien aimé Gotham Watson process. I think that's right. So. Um, I guess, right, so it's a, I guess you all know what is a Gotham Watson process. It's a random tree where like there's a, initially, I guess in the, in the, in the setting of Gotham and Watson, right, it was like about aristocrats. So there's a male aristocrat that is, has a certain number of sons and these all have sons, right, randomly. And then you ask whether there's a, whether the last name will die out or not. And interestingly, if you look at this paper, it seems to be completely wrong. But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. So what we show is that the cluster you can kind of embed this Gotham Watson process in it, and uh, then if it has uh, mean offspring more than one, um, it um, it will be infinite with positive probability. Uh, and here, yeah, what I here said this is just 
uh, th that's not necessarily very helpful. So we'll show there's no infinite path starting from the origin, but that's more or less saying that there's no percolation. Um, this is the more difficult part in a sense. Um, right, so where did this pi over three lambda come from? And yeah, so yeah, so adding the origin and then taking the cell of that. So the cell of the origin is called the typical cell, and that's uh, uh, for good reason. So um, if you take, let's say, a large uh, region of the hyperbolic plane in this case, and you take the, all the cells of points that lie inside it, or you take the appropriate average, then the average, for instance, the average number of sides of the cells in that big area is going to be the mean sides of the, of the typical cell, right? And there are more things, the number of cells that have uh, three sides will be uh, the probability that this cell has uh, three sides. And it's not uh, very difficult, difficult to prove. We're not going to be using that explicitly. But anyway, so this is the, um, the typical cell in lambda is one. And uh, here's a simulation where I took lambda equal to 110. So not surprisingly, it got bigger, right? Because I'm, I'm throwing less points in a sense down. But also what you can notice, so the number of other cells that it touches has also grown. Right in here, it even got uh, a lot bigger. So now it's one over 25. And um, right, so you can actually show, or um, Yuki now Izukawa has shown that actually quite surprisingly, you can work it out exactly for every value of lambda, what is the average number of uh, cells that the typical cell will touch. And it's exactly this formula, six plus three over pi lambda. Um, and also interestingly enough, so know that if I send lambda to infinity, it just becomes six. And this is classically uh, also first done by a Dutch person in the 50s. So it's actually six for the Euclidean plane, right? So that's nice. It fits with the intuition that uh, it should look more and more like a Euclidean plane. And then if lambda goes to zero, right, this becomes a dominant term. And you see that we take basically one over that is the critical probability. So it's in some sense when you have uh, one, one black neighbor on average. This is where the, the point happens. So which ties into this thing with the Gold and Watson tree, right? So if there's, uh, uh, you have on average strictly more than one son, you're going to, your last name can live forever. And if, if it's strictly less than one, it's not gonna, you're not gonna survive. Yeah, we're all okay so far? Yeah. Um, right. And uh, so also, so you can, uh, if you look at these computations of Isakawa or you look at some of the computations we did in our um, paper, what you can show is that um, the dis almost all neighbors of the origin are going to have this distance. So it's some, some function of lambda that goes to infinity as lambda goes to zero, plus or minus. So they actually all live in a kind of fairly small analyst. Um, which is helpful. So what we're so for the upper bound construction, so you kind of do more or less the obvious thing. So you want to do a breadth first search um, construction, right? So here's the origin, and then uh, I somehow uh, find the neighbors of the origin, and then I find the neighbors of those, and so on. And um, I want to show that this behaves like a Gotham Watson process. Of course, the problem is that as I find the neighbors, I also uncover information about the Poisson process uh, so far. So it's not directly clear that there will be, uh, it will behave like independent uh, increments, right? Or that when I have already what the, the, the new children of this guy, there, there's some uh, area which I know to be empty or where I know there are points that are, are going to be in my way. Um, uh, but yeah, so the point is, so you can kind of deal with that by, um, by sticking only to restricting your search process. So you stay inside this analyst that I said before, right, with a certain radius. And then uh, whenever I pick the, the children of a particular point, I, I'm not going to take everyone in the analyst. I'm going to uh, restrict my attention only to uh, certain black points that have an angle that's big enough between them, right? So here, if here's the, this is the kind of parent, right? And I, I only kind of restrict attention to children where the, 
the angle is sufficiently large. I don't know if that makes sense. Where sufficiently large is actually a very small constant. And uh, it turns out that if you, if you do this, then uh, indeed the, the fact that you've um, searched on the hyperbolic plane so far, it doesn't really bother you too much, uh, which may seem weird. But uh, so here's a picture just to give the intuition, right? So I uh, suppose that uh, I've kind of built already a big tree. And uh, so I'm exploring the, the children of this point. And I've, I'm sort of uh, potentially want to add this uh, child here, right? And I know that in this purple area, I, I maybe haven't searched before, right? So that looks like a very small slice of the hyperbolic plane. If the point that I'm currently exploring is, uh, if I uh, if I put it at the origin of the of the Poincaré disk, but actually if I make an isometry and I put it somewhere near the boundary, then the area that I now sort of have unexplored, let's say, is actually really large, right? So it looks like I, so if if the whatever I've I've done before is sort of contained in this white area. If I change perspective, it's actually in a really small part, and I have almost all the hyperbolic plane left over to play around with. Okay. So I'm just waving my hands at you. But so you can actually make it stick. So you can make kind of uh, embed this uh, Galton Watson process in there. And unlike in, uh, so there's similar models, similar arguments actually work, uh, particularly in high dimensional Euclidean percolation uh, setting. Uh, but here, so here, this Gotham watch process actually it works forever, right? So for if I do it in Euclidean setting, typically after a finite number of uh, generations, uh, it will break. Like so, right? So if if I have a Gotham Watson process with mean uh, one plus epsilon, right? After n generations, I have like exponentially many uh, many po I would expect exponentially many points in my in my tree. So if I Take, um, um, so I haven't mentioned, I said I wouldn't do any history of percolation theory, but if I, so if I take a d dimensional grid, right, and I just uh, f color the points black or white with probability p, yeah, then so there's a result from uh, by Gordon and independently Kesson and independently Harris-Slay that says that critical probability will be roughly 1 over 2d. So there, there are 2d neighbors now, right? And if I take p equals 1 over 2d, uh, I would have on average one black neighbor, right? So there's a, a, a similar, you can do a similar argument here, but of course after, um, after a certain number of steps, right? After finitely many steps, some constant number of steps of this tree, you're going to have exponentially many neighbors in your critical, supercritical Galton Watson tree. But they will be at distance n in the Euclidean lattice, right? So sooner or later, that's going to break, right? Because it's only polynomial and n many uh, possible points, right? So, but here in the hyperbolic plane, you don't. So, in some sense, this is uh, similar but easier because there's so much space in the hyperbolic plane that your tree can just uh, keep growing forever. Yeah, and so, yeah, so then you can kind of reuse uh, computations for this typical point to show that, in fact, um, if you set it up properly, the, um, the expected number of children in each step is uh, bigger than one. Yeah. Is that okay with everyone? Um, yeah, so let's try and say something about the lower bound. So lower bound is, uh, more complicated and also more, more novel in a sense, right? So this, the technique for the, for the upper bound on PC is kind of uh, very similar to what goes on in, um, like particularly the proof of Keston for this um, high dimensional uh, percolation. The lower bound is kind of funny, right? So there's very, there's even the first people to define percolation were uh, Broadbent and Hammersley in the late 50s. So they already had this argument to say that, so if P is such that, so P is, let's say, uh, less than one over 2D, right? Then there cannot be um, an infinite component in this lattice setting, right? Because like, um, well, I could, um, 
I could just consider this expiration, right? I take the black neighbors of the origin, right? And then uh, at every step, um, I try to find the black neighbors of this guy. But then there might be, there might be some points that I've already seen. So every time, there's less than 2D chances, uh, possible neighbors that they can add, right? So there's kind of this um, um, monotonicity that uh, at every step, if I try to grow this tree, let's say, there's uh, the expected number of neighbors is always less than 2D times P, right? But in our setting with this, um, with these four noise cells, it's, it's not, there's no obvious monotonicity, right? Because if I, I gathered some information, then I know some areas are empty, there are some black points and white points. It's not clear whether sometimes information might help, sometimes it may not help, so it's not so clear what to do, which is different, uh, yeah. W yeah, which needs a, a new kind of argument. Um, and yeah, so one um, very naive approach is of course um, to say, well, we can still try to estimate the number of points starting from the origin, that the number of paths that have uh, length k and start at the origin and just show that the expected number of paths goes to zero, right? So that would be, that's uh, essentially what the um, Broadband and Hammersley did. But of course, that's, uh, that's also kind of, yeah, not doesn't seem feasible, at least for me, because yeah, as you, as you count the expected number of paths, right, so um, there may be pa paths uh, you don't know where they go, so they may actually, um, it seems unlikely, but if they, paths that spend a lot of time in kind of the same area, it's very hard to compute because like, um, why do you, um, there's four, four, uh, four, two, four noise cells to touch, right? There's certain area has to be empty, and then there's a lot of information, um, <coughs> a lot of information that you would have to keep track of, and it's very hard to, to really make something that uh, works properly. Um, so what, the, oh yeah, that's kind of what I said here, right? So um, the, the trick that we, um, apply, at least uh, on an intuitive level, it's like basically, so if, if there is an infinite path, right? So maybe I can, yeah, so let me say, so for a, if, if the cell of this guy and the cell of this guy are touching, right? So what needs to happen is there needs to be some disk that has no other Poisson points inside it and it needs to be touching uh, as the, these two guys on the boundary, right? So the reason for that is, right, so the, the boundary between the two cells is the points that are equidistant to both, uh, both of these points here, yeah? And any point on here is therefore uh, as equidist is equidistance to these two things, right? And moreover, um, right, there cannot be any point closer because then otherwise this Poisson, the Poisson, the Voronoi cell of that point would contain uh, this point here, right? So it's basically, you can think of these paths as, so I've got a sequence of points where each time there's kind of an empty disk that touches, touches both and it does have, doesn't have anything else in it, um, right? And yeah, so nicely in the Poincare disk, they also look still like Euclidean disks that are, are touching these things. So if, there, if there's an infinite path, right, there will be all these disks sort of that are empty Right, and so what's annoying is if the path starts to kind of interact with its previous self, right? So with the parts that you know, already know to be empty. But so what we kind of do is we say, well, we pick something called a chunk. So there's a, a certain, uh, certain path. And uh, so we keep building a path until something happens that uh, is uh, annoying, right? Dif difficult to deal with. Um, <coughs> And so basically, so what we, what we have is, uh, if there's an infinite path, it may, of course, come back to the same region many times, but we always just skip forward to the last time there was an interaction with uh, what we, so we built first uh, something called, a, we call it a chunk, right? We stop when something bad happens, like an edge is too long or some angle is uh, in a way that we don't want. And then we skip forward to the last time the, the infinite path might have interacted with this path and we build a new chunk and then we, 
again skip forward to make another uh, chunk, right? I don't know how much sense that makes, but then it turns out that then the kind of uh, computations are tractable. So we're able to show that the expected number of such infinite uh, sequences of infinite chunks are uh, going to zero as the number of chunks uh, goes to infinity. So that's, yeah, but it's, yeah, like I said, it's a 70 page paper and I don't think anybody would enjoy seeing the details, including myself. Um, so, um, yeah, so yeah, I'll, uh, kind of this is kind of what I already said. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there are any questions about this. Or, yeah. Um, yeah, so let me then, um, before I let you go to lunch, uh, some, so here's some possibilities for further work in this direction. Uh, so one question that we got actually quite quickly after we put the paper on archive, Itai Benjamini actually emailed us this question. Um, so I, yeah, I saw his name tag, but he's, he didn't come uh, to this meeting. So yeah, maybe it's better to ask him about it. I don't know exactly what he had in mind, but he's saying so, uh, right, if you take this lambda to infinity case, right, so we show that locally it looks more and more like the Euclidean case. And so one of the holy grails in percolation theory is to show that at a critical value, there's something called conformal variance of the crossing probability. So um, I don't know if I should <laughs> explain that. So maybe there is a way to adapt some of our arguments to kind of very delicately look at this, you know, lambda going to infinity and p approaching one half in an appropriate way to kind of prove that. So what we, what you would expect is at least the there's a certain family of, uh, right, uh, Möbius transformations which are conformal at their isometries of the Poincaré disk under which um, crossing probability should kind of uh, be preserved, um, right? But it seems so we, like th at this time we already needed Ben to, Ben already wanted to get his thesis and so we didn't, uh, think about it too hard, but certainly the, the methods that we employed in the paper seem to be a bit too crude. You'd have to do uh, more work to actually get that. And another obvious question, so this was already in the paper by Itai and Odette Schramm. So can, I sh can you show that uh, the critical probability is strictly increasing lambda, right? So we've thought about it a bit, but there, yeah, all the things that we tried uh, didn't seem to work out. And of course, another one is can, if it's differentiable. It seem, seems natural, but I uh, don't know exactly how to go about it. Uh, and here's a conjecture uh, by ourselves. So maybe you can show that PC is uh, strictly less than this number here, which is what makes it the number of neighbors to be one on average. And some, something similar is actually true for uh, high dimensional Euclidean uh, percolation. So there's after this work by Gordon and Kesten and Harsley that I mentioned, people have looked at low order, the, the lower order terms for the critical probability. So you can show that it's uh, a bit more than one over the, uh, the degree. So yeah, May maybe it's true, maybe not. Another natural thing is of course, try to generalize everything that we did to higher dimensional um, hyperbolic space, right? But now there's some, fac uh, some complicated, uh, complicating factors, right? So, well, first of all, certainly in the Euclidean case, um, three-dimensional percolation is, seems to be way harder than two-dimensional percolation. And uh, for, especially for Voronoi, per yeah, for Voronoi percolation, there's no dimension where uh, PC is known other than two. So the, it's, uh, it seems to be kind of hard, right? Because, so one of the conjectures might be show that PC will be equal to uh, whatever is PC for the Euclidean case, if lambda goes to infinity. Right? The other one would be that if lambda goes to zero, we have something like one over the expected number of neighbors of the typical degree is asymptotics of PC, right? But again, asymptotic number of neighbors of a typical cell in any dimension, maybe in dimension three it's known, but in other dimensions it's not, uh, it's not known, as far as known. especially if D goes to infinity, it's, uh, it's not, uh, not done. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's our s those are some open problems that I can offer. Um, 
Yeah, uh, oh yeah, and then, so, oh yeah, here's, this is um, something that I'm doing, so together with my current PhD student and Zagaka Blutschko from Münster, we are trying to uh, adapt this method to work for Vernoy percolation in high dimensional Euclidean space. That's uh, ongoing work. Um, yeah, so um, that's all I wanted to say, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tobias. Questions from the audience? Hi, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, do I was wondering how much do people like or know or expect when lambda goes to infinity in that picture? Like, for example, like, I mean, okay, conformal invariance, I guess it's believed, but, um, but like other things like, uh, like maybe stronger things like almost every realization of your Poisson point process gives you the same picture, uh, percolation picture or things like that. Well, I mean, it, it's not going to be the same percolation picture, right? Because it's like... Uh, I mean, I'm talking about lambda going to infinity. Yeah, yeah, but there's there, for any value of lambda, there's always a little window where you get infinitely many uh, components that are, you know, black components. It's always, like, yeah, it's, it is always, on a global scale, it's always different. Like, I don't know if that's answering the question, but... Um, Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, if I fix any region, then locally it will look more and more like, uh, like the Euclidean case, but globally there's like also, so there's also papers that show that if you take a random walk, it's going to be transient as opposed to recurrent, right? So if I just jump from one Voronoi cell to the next randomly, then uh, even though locally it looks like a Euclidean case where it's, tra it's known to be uh, recurrent, so you always return with probability one to the same cell eventually, in, uh, for any intensity lambda on the hyperbolic plane, you have a positive probability of never returning to where you came from. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. Um, Thank you. I, uh, in, in your talk, so you never changed the fact that the cells have constant cost meaning you always go to the closest one. Does it make easier? Sorry, what is, what is constant cost? Um, I mean, for your Voronoi cell, you yeah. would just take the cheapest one in sense of the closest one, but y if you add a random cost to the cell, to a Voronoi cell, instead of tugging with only P and lambda, you just add some cost that might be random or just depend on the color of the cell. Does it make things harder? Does the same method work? But what is, it, what is the cost? Where does the cost play a role? I don't understand. In, in changing the shape. Oh, the yeah. You yeah, process. okay. Yes. You want to... Uh, I mean, I is it possible that it actually makes the problem easier to study? Possibly. Uh, yeah. So what I, what I didn't say, but one thing that we actually proved is that so we, if you switch between the a hyperbolic metric and Euclidean metric. So I take a realization of a hyperbolic Poisson point process, but then I compute the Voronoi cells using the Euclidean metric. Um, the picture looks different, but actually combinatorially it's the same. So it's, they are adjacent if and only if they're in the other metric. And all, yeah. But I don't know, yeah, if you, maybe you can change the, the way you make the cells in such a way that it's easier, I don't, I don't know. Uh, hi, uh, can you say a bit more if you, what do you know about these infinite clusters, uh, like for instance how, how many ends they would have to touch the boundary? Sorry, can you repeat? The, the infinite, infinite uh, cluster, if you, once you see an infinite cluster, how many ends that uh, they were going to go to the boundary? Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess it, so if it's infinite, once it's unique, it's only one. The other one, I mean, it's kind of tree-like, so yeah, I'd have to, it's probably known, but uh, my guess would be that in this intermediate regime, it's infinite. Uh, it's rather tree-like, the, uh, the clusters. Infinite, 
Okay, and another question is if you take the p equal to one half all the time, yeah. you always have infinite cluster, and then you let the uh, uh, lambda goes to infinity. Yeah. The limit should still have some. <coughs> there's some. Is there something which would stay like this infinite cluster? Well, I. Uh, I guess so what like locally it will yeah so if you send lambda to infinity and you there there will be with probability 1 some infinite cluster right but i guess they're they're getting thinner and thinner probably mm -hmm. in some sense so i uh, know yeah in, you won't see it in if you look at a small piece you won't see it i, I guess okay thanks thanks a lot More? Yeah. So, uh, what do you know about the behavior on PC? Lambda? So, uh, personally, <laughs> not too much. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so in the, the proofs that we did for uh, certainly the lambda to infinity case, right, you just uh, well, it's enough to take uh, one plus, uh, half plus epsilon, half minus epsilon, and analyze these cases. So we didn't try to push that. So we don't have, uh, yeah, it's, it would be quite technical to try and uh, get, get sort of in, into some kind of critical window. So, yeah. Uh, is it uh, some results on the other critical exponents? like near critical what is the uh, expected size of the cluster or I after uniqueness what is the connection probability of two power point uh, okay i don't think that um, there's anything known about that for certainly for this case and yeah also like one of the things that makes uh i guess in my opinion vonoy percolation interesting is that it's sort of slightly more difficult to analyze even than uh, some euclidean models right so these these all these critical exponents seem to be out of reach. Like, uh, Someone else? Very quick question about this, this last, <coughs> the very last slide, the very last comment. So you're, you say, you mentioned that your, your uh, exploration of sphere here works for high D Euclidean settings, so this branching process approximation. Can you quantify how large D has to be so that this uh, that this uh, uh, that this hyperbolic idea you had yeah. here also works in that in that Euclidean? Yeah, I don't know. So I, of course, it's ongoing work with my PhD student, who like, and and we're on camera. So <laughs> I don't know if how much I should say, but yeah. Um, Let's go offline. <laughs> but it's uh, so no. I mean, the idea is just to show that for some high enough d, so if you take p equal to the right thing times uh, one plus epsilon, then for some very crazy high d, it will be percolating, right? And sort of the main idea is to try and adapt these techniques by it's logarithmic in or, or no. It's actually so the so the so the typical degree in so I I'm not gonna. I don't want to spoil too much, but it's, so there are various formulas for the Euclidean case, in, but a lot of them are like default integrals from which it's very hard to extract asymptotics, but asymptotics is roughly, a, it's a constant times d times two to the d, right? And so we, uh, so it will be one over that will be the, will be PC, it will be sort of, uh, and there were already previous bounds, there are some previous bounds that are roughly in the same ballpark. So it's like something, ta a polynomial times two to the d or, or upper and lower bounds for uh, that are in the literature. Okay, thanks. More questions? Seems not to be the case. Okay, let's thank Tobias again then. Okay.